an interview with the General Conference President, church planting, and a missionary returns to where he once served. Coming up next. Hello and welcome to Mission 360, I'm Gary Krauss. Today's program is coming to you from Tokyo, Japan. And I'm standing in the heart of Tokyo in front of a statue of a dog, a farm dog. Now it seems an odd place to position such a statue, but this is an important statue because it still resonates in the hearts of Japanese people today. In fact, tourists from around the world and here in Japan come in their thousands every day to pay tribute to this dog who was born back in 1923, but after his owner's death, every day for nine years, faithfully came to the train station, hoping to greet him. And there's something about that faithfulness and fidelity that still resonates in the human heart, whether you come from a secular or a religious background. And on today's program, we're going to be looking at faithfulness in mission, not just here in Japan, but around the world. First up, Let's look at the importance of church planting. When you plant a seed, you water it. You let it soak up the sunshine. And you let God do his part to make it grow. So what if we aren't planting vegetables or flowers? What if we are planting churches? Every year, thousands of Seventh-day Adventists set out to plant a church. Some are pastors. Some are lay people, such as global mission pioneers. These church planters go into an area where there is no Seventh-day Adventist church. Some church planters go out on their own. Some are sponsored by their conference or mission. Some, like global mission pioneers, are sent out thanks to generous supporters who believe that we have a mission to reach the unreached. Church planting is not some new method. It goes right back to the early Christian church. It was through church planting that the early Christian church multiplied. Everywhere the Apostle Paul went, he couldn't stop talking about a risen Savior. He had a message of hope that he couldn't keep to himself. The Adventist church grew in the same way. They had a unique message to share with the world, but they only had one local church in Washington, New Hampshire. But that quickly changed as Adventists started crisscrossing the country, starting new groups of believers. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has grown tremendously since those early years. In 2016, a new Adventist Church was established every 3.3 hours somewhere in the world. Yet despite tremendous growth, there are many people who have still not heard the Adventist message or even the name of Jesus. In fact, two-thirds of the entire population of this planet don't know Jesus. Sometimes people ask, 
Why church planting, church planting, church planting? Why the emphasis on church planting? Global Mission is all about church planting. Why, why the emphasis? The answer to that is because we are wanting to expand our borders. If we continue to put all of our resources into the same places that we've always put our resources, we're not going to grow, we're not going to move into the unreached people groups, those who have not yet heard of Jesus. People will sometimes say, I go to a church and it's not even half full, why don't we fill that one first? If we did that, we would still be in New Hampshire. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is all about growing, moving into unreached groups, starting churches where there are none, because that is what Jesus asked us to do. And then, he said, he'll be able to return. The Great Commission is to go into all of the world, to all people groups, to make disciples. And discipleship takes place among groups of believers. We thank God for the literally thousands of new groups that have been planted and established since Global Mission began in 1990. Yet the challenge remains. Thank you for your prayerful support of sending more church planters into the field. My guest is Elder Ted Wilson, who's the General Conference President. Thanks for joining us today, Elder Wilson. Privilege. We're here in Tokyo, Japan, and this represents a large mission challenge for the church, as does the entire 1040 window. Can you describe that a little bit for us? The 1040 window and even places that are outside of that window, because that's just a technical term. So many places have such a small percentage of Christians and even smaller percentage of Seventh-day Adventists. So we're talking about places that are very focused on traditional religion, uh, religions that uh, are of a nature that promote uh, some kind of, of salvation through works, through honoring ancestors, through going through a process rather than the wonderful grace and uh, blood of Jesus Christ, which offers to us uh, salvation. The 1040 window represents an enormous population base, one that seems to be almost hardened to the ability for Seventh-day Adventists to penetrate. But I want to tell you something. Here in Japan, we have seen as we preached the word and as people have been coming and lives have been touched, that it doesn't matter what culture you're from, what background, it doesn't matter if it's in the 1040 window or not, people's hearts are touched when they understand the love mm -hmm. of Christ. And I think that's one of the things that we simply need to emphasize even more in the 1040 window, and we need more people to do that. Right. So here in Japan, where the Seventh-day Adventist Church is very small in comparison with uh, about 127 million people, we're seeing that the church is coming alive and they're getting excited about evangelism and witnessing. And this is something that I think is going to do something extraordinary. The Holy Spirit is at work. Right. And he crosses all barriers and so does the love of Jesus. So, Amen. Um, so when you look at the church here, you see signs of hope, signs of Big renewal. Hope. Big <laughs> hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, this morning I saw a number of young people in the worship service. Um, an institution here like the, the, the clinic, what, what sort of potential do you see here? Oh, I tell you, the uh, Tokyo Adventist Hospital and the clinic that they have and the outreach, it's a tremendous force for touching the lives of people who otherwise would never come in contact with Seventh-day Adventists. That's why Jesus uh, led out in doing more healing than he did preaching. Right. That's why Jesus interacted with people in such a powerful way, and that's why he asks us to be involved in, in comprehensive health ministry, in medical missionary work, not just for the sake of making healthy sinners and people who will never be one to the Lord, but introducing them to the one who is all health, the one who can give them a balance in life, physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. Uh, the fulfillment of 3 John verse 2, that God wants us to be in health, just as our soul prospers and is in health. So the aspect of 
Tokyo Adventist Hospital, of the clinic, of different hospitals and healthcare institutions, and the people working in them can be a tremendous opening door to touching the lives of so many people who then will say, but why are you doing this? And then they can talk about the beautiful relationship with the master physician. Mm, wonderful. Now, I, I read from time to time the statistics on an aging population here in Japan, loneliness, um, people being found dead in their apartments because they didn't have family around. Is this an area that we as a church can be contributing to? Absolutely. In fact, the relational aspect of dealing with people and their needs is exactly what Jesus is asking us to do in these very last days before Christ's coming. He wants us to be able to reach out and to be able to touch the lives in not only spiritual Bible study, which is so vital and absolutely crucial, but in kind acts showing the love of Christ mm. and then leading people to the one who can make things truly possible in their lives to help them to find meaning in life. One of the challenging things, one evening we couldn't even go home on, a, on the train. We've been taking the train from, uh, uh, from Tachikawa, where we're staying, uh, here to Amanuma, and uh, we couldn't go on the train because, unfortunately, some terrible accident took place and the police had to come investigate because they have many people who commit suicide by stepping in front of a train. There are so many people who are uh, very uh, discouraged and depressed. In fact, uh, the church uh, in this All Japan 2018 Maranatha Evangelistic Meetings, that's what they have named it here, uh, there are individuals in Okinawa, we visited there, where they are helping people to understand about uh, depression and recovery from that through the power of God. All over this country, we need to be touching people who are in real need because that's the key to bringing them to the one who can make them complete. Yes, exactly, because it's easy to be rich and increased with goods and feel as if you have need of nothing. So when we look for the, to the future, we see hope because we have a message that these people need. They may not realize it, but they need. Well, and I think really as we pray earnestly, and I'm doing this now, trying to do it on a daily basis, we all need to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives because, and pray for the latter rain of the, of the Holy Spirit because that is what's going to be the great key to reach these millions of people in the 1040 window who haven't even heard the name Jesus have no relationship at all to him. What a powerful opportunity we have. Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us today, Order Wilson. And viewers at home, please pray for the people in the 1040 window and pray please specifically for Japan. Uh, it's a church that is small, but we see that there's great needs in this community of people who need to know Jesus as their savior for their lives now and for eternity. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Mission 360. If at any time you want to look at some episodes that you may have missed or re-look at some stories, just go to m360.tv and there you'll find everything about Mission 360. Next up, we travel with a mission leader revisiting a territory where he once served. We're here in Cambodia and I am uh, visiting with Wesley Samko, who is the Director for Adventist Mission for the Southern Asia Pacific Division. Is that right? That's right, yes. Fantastic. So I understand you actually used to live here in Cambodia as a missionary. Is that right? Yes, we're here in Battambong uh, and uh, I actually lived here as well as before that in, uh, in Siem Reap uh, okay. in a couple of different places. So, yes. Okay. So coming back now, um, you're the coordinator for the division. So I imagine you come to Cambodia often. How has the church changed since the time that you were actually living here full time? Well, that's a very good question. You know, uh, when we first came here, uh, we moved into Battambong. It was, it was an interesting thing because Battambong is the second biggest city in, uh, in Cambodia. Okay. But even though it's the second biggest city, it's really not that big. Um, okay. But you kind of, you know, Siem Reap, you get more of the touristy feel. Phnom Penh's the big city. Battambong kind of feels more like the heart of the people. Okay. And uh, so as we're here, uh, we came, uh, 
we, we had to literally drive around and knock on houses to see if we could find a place to live. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> but when we went here, the church at that time was just, just a small handful of members. Mm -hmm. And we were worshiping in, in an older uh, church that was made of wood, termite ridden, ready to fall down with the next big wind. And, uh, and the people here were so poor, just no ability to, to change anything. And I remember just praying to God saying, God, how can this work be restored here? How can it grow again? Uh, mm -hmm. Because it used to be a strong point when the church first began. Um, how can it grow? And now uh, there's a new UCI program that's happening here, uh, a huge new center that's being built. The church is growing more vibrant. There's a lot of ministries happening to reach the surrounding communities again. So it's really exciting to see how, you know, in a way God answered that prayer as, as we prayed back then for, for the work of God to move forward and to branch out. So it's exciting to see how God has taken hold of the mission here and, and really spreading things. That's awesome. That's awesome. Can you tell me a little bit more about their vision for the UCI? Like what will it include? Yes. You know, I think for all urban centers of influence, which is what yeah. UCI stands for. Sorry, I always get caught up in these <laughs> little the letter things. Yeah, you know, um, the whole purpose is is to try to create an opportunity con to connect with the community mm -hmm. and to be able to really build those, you know, not only just a, a chance to meet and talk with people, you know, now everyone's on their smartphone and it's hard to even have a conversation. Even so here not in just, Cambodia. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's we amazing. You go into a small village and somehow they have a smartphone. But right. anyway, um, you know, so the idea is to try to create some kind of contact with the people mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, there's an opportunity for relationship, but not just a, a casual conversation, something that allows the relationship to go deeper mm -hmm. so that there's op opportunity to look for people who the Holy Spirit is working in, to look for spiritually interested people and then working and partnering with God to try to really serve those people, to help them to know God and, and see God in a deeper way uh, so that they can begin their own relationship with God. So I think that's really the idea is different, different things that will happen with the center. Uh, they're looking right now, you know, starting with language lessons, music classes. Uh, you know, so there's some there's some Bible classes in the, in the group of believers that meets on, on Sabbath morning. Right. But to be able to extend those, those points of contact and ways of contacting with the restaurant and other things in the future clinic. Um, but really to be able to get into the lives of people uh, to really begin to see... You know, who are those who God is working in? How can we help them grow? And how can we uh, help them experience and, and disciple into a, a relationship and life with God? Right. So, so that's kind of the, the view, you know, create those contacts, make those relationships and see God work through them to create disciples. Right. That's wonderful. That's what I'm so excited to hear about this work. Yeah, so, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the specific challenges that Cambodia as a whole is facing? Or the Adventist Church in Cambodia specifically? Yeah. I, I think, you know... As in many places, especially, you know, since Cambodia went through such a devastating time during the, the years of the Khmer Rouge, mm. there's a lot of pain and, and stuff in the lives of people. But also, you know, some of the things that we expect in some of our other cultures from different places around the world, you know, we have a history of, of education and of development and of growth. Mm. And so here, you can imagine kind of a generation being taken out and that's lost. And so really, I think in Cambodia, there's a lot of Kind of a restored education and growth and 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 building of capacity again and okay. i think especially for the church you know it the church didn't exist for a while in this country and as as refugees began they we reached people in the refugee camps they came back into the country and began to to share their faith in different places in small groups and through a discipling process mm -hmm. but as the, as that came back you know, as the church grows and as there's more need for different kinds of, of gifted people and, and, and individuals with leadership to be able to really uh, have the capacity and the, the knowledge and the skills uh, and confidence to be able to reach out. So I think that yeah. is one of the huge things that we can pray for. Okay. You know, God says pray for workers to go into the harvest field, yeah. but also um, for resources to be able to get the work done. Right. So I think those are two huge things that we can always pray for for this country. Well, thank you so much for sharing. That That's powerful. Thanks for your time also. Appreciate it. And thank you so much for joining us today. Remember to always pray for Cambodia and the work here. If you're enjoying Mission 360, I invite you to follow us on social media. Just go to Facebook and or Instagram and search for Mission 360 TV and then click like or follow. Next up, we'll learn more about church planting. The sower went out to sow. 
some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where the soil was thin. The plants grew, but in the hot sun, they withered and died. Some seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on the good soil, where it produced an abundant crop, a field of believers growing together to the glory of God. Farmers know that good soil takes preparation. They cut trees, haul rocks, and plow the field. They could just scatter the seeds and hope for the best. But best results come through preparation. Christ's method of ministry prepares soil. Jesus mingled with people. He felt their pain and showed them sympathy. He met their needs and won their confidence. Then they were ready to follow him. Around the world today, thousands of church planters are putting Christ's method of ministry into practice. For best results, farming takes time. So does planting a church. Why church planting? Because it's part of the Gospel Commission. Because it's how the early church grew. And it's how the Seventh-day Adventist church has grown. And last, but not least, it works. Well, that's about it for today's program. And I hope that you've been inspired and challenged by our 360 degree view of mission around the world. And I hope that you've got a taste of the mission challenge that we face in urban areas such as Tokyo. Millions and millions of people who God loves so much. And I want to thank you for your continuing involvement in mission through your peer prayers, through your finances, through your personal involvement. Before we go, let's watch this mission music video. And as we watch it, let's take the opportunity to pray about mission, pray about the cities, and pray about our personal involvement. For Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Krause, and I hope that you can join me next time right here on Mission 360.
تو 